and roll call and establish a quorum. This meeting okay. is being recorded. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, my name is Samantha gambles -Farr. I'm the chair of the IMPACT Committee. Um, thank you for tuning in and joining us today. Um, I would like to start the meeting out by uh, calling this meeting to order. The time is now one o'clock. Um, first, we will start with a roll call and establishment of a quorum. Um, first, we have our vice chair, Dr. Edward Ray. Here. Dr. Andrea Espinoza. Dr. Andrea Espinoza, I know she's here. I Present. see her coming back in. Present. Thank you. Uh, right. Nurse Practitioner Jan Johnson Griffin. Present. Uh, nurse Practitioner Dr. Kevin Maxwell. Present. Uh, nurse Practitioner Sally Pham. Present. And our public uh, member, uh, Betha Schnell. Present. Thank you. Um, all members of the impact committee are present and we have established a quorum. Um, second order of business, uh, um, 2.0 general instructions for the format of the teleconference. I will hand that back over to our moderator. Thank you. Good afternoon. This is the BRN moderator. I will be moderating the meeting. To facilitate public comment, we will be utilizing the WebEx question and answer feature. When the committee reaches a point in the agenda at which public comment is appropriate, the question and answer feature will be turned on and members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by inserting the phrase, I would like to make a comment in the question box, which is typically in the lower right of your screen. I will then call on the individual and unmute their microphone. The individual will have two minutes to make their comments. I will not give a warning as your time approaches. I will mute your microphone and will announce that your time has exceeded the time allotted. I will then move on to the next member of the public who has a comment. Please note that the question and answer feature is being used only as a means for members of the public to represent that they would like to make a verbal comment. This is not a means to ask questions of the moderator or members of the committee. Such inquiries submitted using this feature will not be answered. When asking a question, please make sure the question is directed at me in the drop down. I will provide a brief reminder of this approach at the start of each public comment item. Finally, when committee members or senior staff are not speaking, I would like to remind them to mute their microphone. If I detect background noise during the meeting as a result of unmuted microphones, I will mute them myself. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. We will now move on to agenda item 3.0, public comments for items not on the agenda. This is specifically for items on future agendas. I will hand the, uh, the mic back over to our BRN moderator. Thank you. We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment. Please remember, you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Committee Chair Gambles Barr, there are no public requests for comment. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, please, and thank you. Now we're moving on to agenda item 4.0, review and vote on whether to approve the previous uh, meeting's minutes. Um, this information was sent out in the uh, uh, supplemental uh, materials um, from May 10th. Um, hopefully everyone has had an opportunity to review the minutes meetings and I will open the floor for any corrections from the committee at this time.
Um, no one has any comments from the committee or any corrections. Okay, hearing none, uh, moderator, would you please open the forum to the public, please, for public comments or corrections? We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment. Please remember, you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Committee Chair, Samantha, this is Lori, the board's executive officer. Yes. Uh, yeah. Before we move on to the next agenda item, can we consider reordering? We do have a couple people that will be presenting. Um, we do have Tracy Montez on here, and she is get, set to present at 9.0. Um, and I would love to have her potentially go first. And then we do have Heather Hoganson that will be presenting um, on the regulatory updates. And I believe that's agenda item 7.0. So um, if we could pull 9.0 and 7.0 out of order and have them go first, I would really appreciate that for the sake of their time. Yes, we will, uh, we will do that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And board moderator, can you elevate Tracy Montes? She's in the attendees. Sure. And did we want to, there are no public requests for comments. Did we want to just close that window? Yes, please. Thank you, moderator. Um, and now we will need to vote um, to approve the previous meeting minutes. Um, may I have a motion to accept the May 10th, 2022 minutes into record? This is Ed, uh, Ed Ray. I so move. May I have a second? I will second, Sally Pham. Thank you. Any abstentions or, or uh, discussion needed? Okay, down the line, uh, Dr. Edward Ray. Yes. Uh, Dr. Andrea Espinoza. Yes. MP Jan Johnson Griffin. Yes. Uh, MP Dr. Kevin Maxwell. Yes. NP Sally Pham. Yes. Uh, public member Betha Schnell. Yes. And Samantha Gamble's FAR votes in the affirmative. Uh, with that being said, we have passed the minutes uh, from May uh, 10th, 2022, and we will um, now move on out of order. Um, EO, um, do we need to take a vote to move out of order or can we just do so? No, as the chair, you can reorder. Okay. Um, are there any committee members who have any uh, issue with uh, me choosing to go out of order? Okay, hearing none, um, we will now move forth with our agenda item number nine out of order. This is an update from the Department of Consumer Affairs um, Office of the Professional Examination Services. Uh, regarding the occupational analysis mandated under the Business and Professions Code 2837.105 by uh, Ms. Uh, Tracy Montez. Ms. Montez, thank you and welcome. We look forward to your update and I will yield the floor to you at this time. Good afternoon. Uh, Tracy, your your audio is cutting in and out, and uh, when we can hear you, it's a little low. Not sure what the issue may be. Let's 
my camera off and see how that helps. Is that better? Well, I could hear you there. Um, it was it was coming through. It was a little low. So maybe if you could uh, maybe get a little closer to the mic. All righty. How's this? It is not good, Tracy. When you said hello, that was loud and clear. And then after that, it um, went very quiet. I'm not sure if you want to um, change your headset or uh, get a headset or uh, maybe sign out and sign back in. Yeah, why don't you go to the next item and then I'll, I'll pop back on. I'll see what I can do. That sounds good. Um, Thank you, Samantha. Mm -hmm. We'll have to pause on agenda item 9.0 and move to 7.0 to allow okay. Tracy to um, work out some technical issues. No problem. So moving out of order once again, we are now going to have um, information only on agenda item 7.0 regarding updates on the regulatory package to implement Assembly Bill 890 um, per the regular session 2019 to 2020. Um, that presentation will be by Heather Hoganson. Ms. Hoganson, thank you very much. I now yield the floor to you. Thank you very much. Um, Heather Hoganson, your regulatory counsel here with a brief update. Um, for those of you who have been following along with the board meetings, the board did um, approve us to move forward with this regulatory package. We have been working um, diligently on the documentation that is required to explain and move forward with this package and with our budget um, requirements to analyze all the fiscal and economic impacts. We are close to finalizing all of that and we expect that this package will proceed to the director's office for her review this month and then it would go from there to uh, the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency for their review. Once they have approved it, it would go to the Office of Administrative Law to be noticed for a 45-day public comment period, after which uh, we would give you any comments in a, in a group for your review and, and consideration. Uh, we are also working on the attestation issues with doing this online so that we don't have to have a form. And, and that, is, that is being worked on with our IT department and that may result in a 15-day modified text notice period later, but we're still working on that to find out. Any questions on the process or anything that I said? This is um, I, Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, is that Dr. Espinoza? Yes. Please ask your question. I'll, I'll write for mine. Okay. Um, I, so it goes after it, go, uh, just before it goes to the public for the 45 period time that they get to review it and make comments. Will we see it before then or at the same time that they receive it? The you would receive it at the same time that it goes out to notice and comment. Um, we can make sure, you know, to to send, uh, you would be all on the mailing list, so you would get it at that same time, yes. And would we have an opportunity then at that time to make comments to the, the chair or who would be the appropriate person? Um, I suppose it depends on what, when your uh, next impact meeting is, we could for sure discuss it at, within the committee meeting, or you are free to write written comments for consideration as either in your public capacity or in your capacity on this committee. Dr. Espinosa, this is um, Lori, the board's executive officer, and I just have some clarifying questions. Are you um, aware of the current regulatory language and have you had a chance to look at that? It has gone um, through this committee on a couple occasions um, with recommendations to the board and the board has accepted those recommendations. Um, are, 
most likely we would love to get out ahead of any of the comments before it actually goes to a um, 45 day comment period with OAL. So if you have concerns or want to review, um, I can uh, assist you to getting a copy of those, the regulatory language. It is on our website. Um, it's been noticed in several board meetings and um, the most recent board meeting did approve um, the package to go forward with the text that was submitted. So um, I would love to give you ample time to review that um, and provide any comments before we go out to OAL. Um, it is in the final stages right now with board staff and should go to the director of DCA for her final review and then to agency for their final review prior to being submitted to OAL for their final review. So um, the intent was to have the NPAC give recommendations at the beginning um, and give those recommendations to our board. So if you are seeing something that is concerning, I would love to hear about it in this um, discussion right now, or if you're needing something specific, I would love to address that. Uh, yeah, no, there wasn't anything specific. I just know that in the middle, there probably will be some corrections or some changes. They may be minor. Uh, and I I just wanted to see if we had access to it. That's all. So uh, if uh, I have seen everything to this point, but okay. if it moves forward and there's something that might be some changes, subtle changes that could potentially make a big difference, I guess I just wanted to see that if if that was possible to see that ahead of time. Um, but it sounds like, uh, or if there is, for example, if we would have the, at least have the opportunity uh, to have a, a meeting discussion uh, with, with everyone, if there was something really uh, glaring that was important enough that everybody be involved in it, that's all. I didn't okay. see anything at this point. No, no, I just Good. want, there's, there's a lot of processes in between there. So I just want to make there, sure that in that process, there wasn't yeah, there something. There's a lot of process between now and then. And um, typically, once it gets submitted, we don't even want to do technical changes. You don't want to do any changes to that language. So if you have concerns, we would love to have them addressed now. If you have even small edits, they would need to be addressed now. And with this agenda item, you can ask those questions. You can seek those clarifications. That can happen here. If we have to make any changes once the package has been submitted, we do have to respond to every single comment that is received. It does go out to 15-day posting for non-substantial changes and um, longer, I believe, 45 days. Is that correct, Heather, if they're um, large changes? So that can delay the this. implementation. And so truly, if there are concerns, even minor, this is the time to have that discussion, Dr. E, so that we can get out ahead of it before it even goes away from the BRN and into DCA. Um, the goal when the board votes to approve the language, they approve it knowing that there should not be any additional changes going forward. So what you have that is approved at the last board meeting should be as close to the final document as possible regarding to text, unless we have to do changes. And those changes do need to be noticed. Okay, and it, and those changes that are right now, you said there, you can get that on the, uh, through the website. So, because it looks really different when, they're, when you uh, have block out, this is what it said, blah, blah, blah. This is what's going to say. Uh, is there a finished co copy or no? It's just the way we saw it the last time with the corrections. So the finished copy will be posted on the website when it goes to notice to the public. Um, occasionally, um, as as we are reviewing and doing the documentation, or the director reviews it, or the ag or agency reviews it you know, um, a comma might be changed, a the might be inserted, you know, just little, little ticky tack for, for lack of a better uh, legalistic term, very non-substantive or technical changes. So if you were to do a, a compare document from what the board voted on 
prior to what's actually going to be posted on the website, there might be a, you know one or two very technical differences. Um, but the idea would be that what the board voted on is going to be posted on the website in its final in the notice form once OAL has done its review. So that will be coming. And then I believe this committee meets again in in October. November. And we should probably be um, November. in November and in or finishing public comment at that point. So you would be able to see whatever the public has commented on as well. And that, but that's already gone to uh, OAS, OAS, right? Or OAS. So, they, so OAL gets it twice, once at the beginning to start the notice period. And then when we are completely done with whatever we want to do, it goes back to OAL for the final submission. And oh, that's when it would become the regulation. So they actually see it twice. So they see it twice and, um, and we won't see it until the second time, correct? Well, it will be it will be public as oh, soon as it okay. goes to them the first time. Okay, that's fine. I yeah. that's all I needed. I, there's nothing that's glaring or that I'm concerned about at all. Okay, Miss Hoganson, I had a couple of questions. Yes. Um. So it's supposed to be with it on the director's um desk within this month, correct? How long does that typically process typically take? Generally, um, over the past. 11 months, I would say she has been taking less than a week. Um, there are some outliers, but she does really try to move them quickly. Okay. And then generally it's agency has asked for 30 days to review and they are usually close with that. So between 30 and 45 days for agency. Okay. The, well, because of all these reasons I'm asking, because it's August right now, and right. we are trying to move through the process and make sure that we have time for um, OAL to have the 45 days, and then the additional time if there's any major uh, substantive um, corrections, and hopefully we won't have any. Um, but just making sure that I was, you know, trying to keep that timeline of January 1, 2023 in mind. So... Right, it, it is getting tighter. Mm -hmm. um, I, I won't lie there, it is it is getting tighter, but there are times when we can you know, request expedites and, and things like that. So um, we are still aiming for, for right about then, yes. Okay. Um, anybody else have any additional questions so I can acknowledge you? No, okay. Well, I would like to now open the um, floor up. Moderator, could you please open for public comment? Two seconds. We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment. Please remember, you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Dr. Stephanie Dittmer would like to make a comment. One second, please. Go ahead, Dr. Dittmer. I would like to uh, clarify the statement and response to Dr. Espinosa. After the current board approved documentation is sent to the public, any member of the impact committee can also make a comment on that report from their own personal perspective. Is that correct? Yes, that is. Uh, Dr. Dimmer, is that the end of your comment? 
Uh, she responded yes in the chat. Board moderator, is there any additional comments? Request for comment, sorry. Uh, somebody, this is Reza, somebody has typed a comment into the comment box. So first, just a reminder to our, our public, uh, if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question, please just uh, type, I would like to make a comment. And then when you're called on, go ahead and make your comment. But in this case, I'll just read it off. It says, what date, uh, this is from Sharon Vogan, what date did she say it would be made available for the 45 day comment period? Um, Either correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe a specific date was given. There are several levels of internal review, um, internal being within DCA and then the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency. Uh, after all of that, it um, it will be filed publicly and made available, and that will kick off the 45 days. Is that right, Heather? That, that is correct. Once once it's gone to OAL and they have approved it for posting, it will be placed on the website and a notice will go out to everyone who has requested to be on the listserv. So it will be um, it will be noticed and and that that will commence, but we don't have a date as of right now. All right. So um, Heather provided a couple estimates of a couple of the levels of review, uh, but those are estimates and and it, it's hard to say you know uh, how long it, depending on whether the director or agency has feedback and you know how many times it, it goes back and forth difficult to say but for the public if you are um, uh, very interested in keeping tabs on it feel free to sign up on the brn website for the mailing list if you haven't already and you'll get the um, most up-to-date information Thank you, Reza. Um, moderator, uh, the same um, person, Sharon Vogan, had asked to make a public comment. Can we please check with her and make sure that she did not have an additional public comment after she had written the question? Go ahead, Ms. Vogan. Hi, thanks. I was trying to get it unmuted. Um, yeah, I um, I think you might have just answered it. She's, she talked about the list serve for this particular um, issue. So if I'm getting emails from the BRN already about me these meetings and everything else, am I already on the list serve for this particular document? <clears throat> um, that's my that's my question. And then um, I just want to understand exactly what happens after the, you know, what's the process after this 45 day period? You know, what does, what do you do with the public comments? I'm, I'm assuming there's a meeting to discuss public comments. And then if there are any, you know, public comments that are serious issues that weren't thought of or something, um, how are those, um, you know, just what's the communication? How are those um, communicated? Like what you guys are thinking about, talking about in the next meeting, um, what what you think is important, and do those does is that meeting the OAL meeting, or does it go to the BRN? I'm just trying to understand what the BRN committee is doing and what the OAL committee is doing, and which organization actually has the document last and you know I, I think you know you know what I mean yeah okay thank you absolutely Sharon thank you for that question we can absolutely answer that for you so once it goes out to public comment if there is comment received the board is required to respond to each one of those comments um, if there's no comment received it um, continues to move forward um, if there are comments received, the board staff will do an initial review and provide um, some kind of guidance on responses to that. And that then would go back to NPAC committee. Those responses would be reviewed by the NPAC committee 
and if accepted um, or accepted with revisions, would then go to um, the board for final acceptance. Again, if there are revisions from the board or acceptance from the board, that would then move forward. If at that point it was decided that the board would not make any revisions, then those responses to the comments that were accepted by the board would go forward to OAL with a final package for review and acceptance. If there are non-substantial changes made, um, it would go out and have a um, smaller notice period. If there were large changes, it would have a larger notice period. And that is to be determined once there is a review of the comments received. One caveat to put out there is that even if the stakeholders, public, make suggestions for changes, it may not be in under the board's ability to do those changes. The majority of the comments that we received in um, uh, some of the stakeholder meetings are changes that they're requesting that we can't legally make under this current set of laws. So with the passing of AB 890, we are still limited to what the board has authority to do by what was created in statute when that bill passed. So there may very well be comments that are responded to that the board does not make any changes and the response is, is we don't have the legal authority to do so. Um, that and when you run across those issues, those issues truly need to go back to um, for a legislative fix, a cleanup bill per se, um, so that those can be addressed. The board is very limited to what we can address in regulation. It has to clearly be outlined in statute for the board to have that ability. So I would not predict that there would be substantial change that comes from a comments period because my understanding with the level of legal review that this process has had and the spotlight that it's been on and, and the multiple conversations that have happened, um, we, the, this committee, as well as the board, um, the greater we, um, has really tried to address each one of those comments within what is allowable within the current statute. Um, the next agenda item, we'll talk more about the additional um, bills that are proposed and out there and how it may affect this. But in its current form, we do have to go forward with um, what it is and what we can legally do within the statutory authority that we have right now. And, and Lori, if I can just piggyback on that just a little bit, um, just to make sure that it's understood by everyone. If the board were to make any substantive changes to the text, either in response to comments or on recommendation um, by this committee or on its own motion, um, it would go out for an additional modified text comment period. So anyone who is getting those emails right now would also get an email that modified text was being uh, considered floated around and there would be a usually a 15 day period to submit comments to that particular changed provision. So just the text that was modified in response to the, pub the first public comment period. And you can have multiple 15 day public comment periods. Um, if it was just again, if it was just a comma or something like that, it wouldn't go out for another 15 day public comment period. And then if it was something considerable that wasn't really in the scope of the regulation to begin with, but now we're adding another level, that's when it would go out for a 45 day again. Um, so there, so anytime that the text is changed substantively, the public is afforded an opportunity to comment on that text. So just wanted to make sure that was clear. Thanks. Uh, and by the way, this is Reza. For, for anyone who's actually interested, this whole process, what Heather just outlined, it's all governed by statute under the Administrative Procedure Act. 
um, in, in the case of rulemaking, it's under government code 11340 and the following sections. Um, so if you're interested in the original source of the authority. Also, I think uh, Ms. Vogan may have had a follow up. Not sure if she's still able to unmute herself, moderator. Hey, thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for those um, answers. I appreciate it. Um, when you said, you know, if the BRN makes um, substantive substantive changes to the text, um, you're, I'm just, <clears throat> what if there's a very strong objection in a follow-up comment period? Um, to to that when it's something that they already voted on to change um, is the OAL like the purpose of the OAL um, is to make sure that any changes are still abiding by the law that did pass and the intent of the law. Um, you know those things are sometimes really close together and I want to make sure that the OAL or somebody is regulating um, that this law really passes and is implemented for the actual intent that it was created. Uh, this is Reza. Oh, Heather, did you want to go or you want me to? Oh, um, sure. Um, one of the things the board will do is with any comment that is actually related to the text, um, the board will uh, create a final statement of reasons that explains the comment, summarizes the comment, and offers a full response to it. And if the Office of Administ Administrative Law does not think that the comment has been appropriately responded to, or if they think the text is vague or exceeds the limits of the BRN's authority, um, or is duplicative of other statutes, you know, they can disapprove that text or send it back to the board to have additional comment periods. So the Office of Administrative Law, OAL, um, is a separate government entity within the state, and they review all regulations, not just from BRN, but every regulation out there um, under the state to make sure that things are consistent and under authority and, and things like that. So they definitely uh, don't hesitate to tell us when they think that something is not clear or could be done um, in a way that better follows the agency authority. And then additionally, Reza typically addresses intent. And I think that's what he was reaching out to do. So Reza, I'll let you address the intent of the law versus what is written in statute. Um, I was actually going to speak on something a little, little different. Um, so I, I'll just mention quickly what I was going to say, and then Lori, if you want me to kind of expand on intent, you can kind of flesh out what you want me to, to get at. But um, I, I, responding to the comment, I think um, almost certainly there will be some some um, substantive comments received during the public comment period regarding aspects of this bill that that may be kind of considered controversial or um, really, really majorly significant aspects of the bill. I, I am pretty confident that that will happen because we've already seen in, uh, as has been discussed, that the several, um, the, the many discussions that we've had so far, starting with the um, stakeholders meeting that we had at, right at the very beginning to each NPAC meeting and at the board, there are stakeholders on kind of opposite sides with, with somewhat different um, views of, of the implementation of this and, and sometimes kind of um, pushing the, the, the direction of this in somewhat opposite directions. So we can kind of count on getting some um, uh, substantive comments. Now, ultimately, the board itself is, is the final authority on the substance of the regulations that we pass. The board will have considered the public comments and decided whether 
uh, you know, what, what substance actually ought to end up in the regulations. And uh, as Lori and as, as Heather have said, um, any substantive comments that are received, the board will address them one way or the other. The board may make changes in response to a comment, in which case it'll go out for further consideration based on those changes, or the board may explain in response to a comment, we're not making changes to the package despite this comment because, and then proceed to explain why, whether it's because there's no authority for the board to do it or be for some other reason, the board doesn't agree with the policy that was um, suggested there. So, so those comments will be addressed one way or the other. The Office of Administrative Law, uh, I, I just wanted to clarify again, the, the board is responsible for the ultimate content. The uh, Office of Administrative Law reviews for um, six standards primarily. Uh, and again, if you're interested, government code 11349 and 11349.1 lays out the standards that OAL um, primarily looks for. Uh, and those are necessity, whether there is a need for the regulation in the first place, authority, in other words, whether the board has legal authority to implement regulations, um, clarity, you know, whether it can be understood, consistency, meaning whether it's consistent with other regulations and with statute, uh, reference that that pertains to the statute that we are uh, intending to make clear or implement and non-duplication. Uh, so they, they look to see, are we just duplicating something that's in statute or elsewhere in regulation? Those are primarily what OAL is looking for. OAL is not driving the policy direction of this. They, they primarily look to um, enforce those standards. Uh, of course, one of the big ones is, does the BRN have authority to, to pass the regulations that it's proposing? So, so they, they do have a pretty significant job besides just, you know, wordsmithing and making sure it's understandable. They, they have a pretty sizable role in all this, but the, the policy decisions are made at the board level with um, full awareness and um, uh, taking into account the public comments. So um, hopefully that, that kind of helps a little bit more to understand the process. And then uh, and Lori, Adam, you address yes, the intent versus what is written in statute. I know that a lot of times there is confusion around that. Um, you, so previously, so I, I thought that's what you were going to address. I apologize. So previously, we've had several public commenters come on and talk about the intent of AB 890 was to do such and such, or the intent was to do this. But that didn't ultimately make it into the business professions code for us to implement. So a lot of organizations had an understanding of what this bill or what this law was going to do and it may not have been executed in the way that um, those organizations thought that it was going to be. Hence, the reason we've had a couple cleanup bills introduced after that to provide additional clarification, which is actually um, uh, an agenda item later on in this meeting. So even if it is in any of the ledge analysis and such that say the intent of this is to do such and such, if there is nothing in statute that allows us to do that, the board cannot move forward with that. So um, that is a, a clear distinction between intent and what was written. A lot of times as the bills move through, there's lots of edits that occur and there is um, sometimes a miscommunication or a misinterpretation. And what happens is a section may have been missed or a um, update didn't carry through all the way. And so it is difficult to move forward with regulations or implement a bill that was passed if all the pieces are not in place. So we understand intent, but truly the board is bound to what is in statute and that may not always align with intent as um, organizations may view.
Thank you, resident EO Melby for the um, in-depth and very clear and concise um, information about uh, the different steps and different statutes and intent. Um, moderator, um, are there any additional comments at this time? There's no um, other request for comments, but Sharon Bogan had a comment in written one in there. Um, do we want Sharon, to let her? No, we actually need to, um, we usually limit it to one time around. Um, we did allow her to go a couple different times. So if she has follow-up questions, Sharon, please reach out directly to me or Reza. You can reach out to me and I could forward to Reza as well. My email is on the website. It is loretta.melby at dca.ca.gov and we can continue this conversation. I'll be happy to work with you on that. Thank you, EO Melby. Um, hearing that there are no additional um, comments, moderator, would you please close the opportunity for public comment? And since that was information only, you don't need to do a vote or anything, and we can go back to agenda item to bring Tracy forward. Okay. Um, that would be agenda item uh, 9.0 for everyone who's keeping up. Um, that is going to be an update from the Department of Consumer Affairs, um, Office of Professional Examination Services regarding the occupational analysis mandated under the Business and Professions Code, Section 2837. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, moderator. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Business and Professions Code Section 2837.105. Um, we will be getting an update from Tracy Montez. Um, Ms. Montez, I yield the floor to you once again. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I hope you can hear me better. Good. <laughs> Got my headphones on. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity to prevent provide this update from the Office of Professional Examination Services. Um, I'm happy to report uh, verbally, which was in a memo dated August 1st uh, to the board, um, that the status of all the occupational analyses workshops have been completed. The report has been actually finalized um, and it is going to provide scopes of practice as these different um, specialty areas practice in California. As far as the status of the National Review Project, we have 11 uh, reports, psychometric review reports that have been finalized. We will be communicating these findings to the respective programs just to um, get additional maybe information, clarification. Um, provide them with some general information about how the process has unfolded. Again, still in the process of uh, gathering information. All of the linkage studies have been completed and I had shared this once before. That's where we look at the national uh, scopes, how they're described in practice and compare that to what is done in California. We've also talked to some physicians um, this spring and summer. And then we do plan to uh, release a summary memo and make a presentation of the recommendations at the November 9th um, Nurse Practitioner um, Advisory Committee meeting and then following up um, to the board after that. And so we're very um, excited to say that the, the project has come together. We're just wrapping up things and we should be on time to present our findings to the committee and then subsequently to the, the board. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that the committee members may have at this time. Yes. Uh, yes, I had a question, Ms. Montes. So you said on November 9th, it goes to the nurse at by a nursing advisory committee and then it goes to the board so when will it come to MPAC? It, it it would come to you first is my understanding but we would leave that to the executive officer so that would be potentially depending on when our meeting which we don't know yet what date is correct uh, correct yes. but hopefully it will come to us first then is what you're saying yes okay that's all. 
Any additional and questions from committee members? I just want to thank Ms. Montez for their hard work. I know that could not have been or isn't easy. So thank you so much. You're very welcome. We're pleased to be part of this um, project. It's been very um, thrilling to learn about the different certifications in the profession and of course expand our knowledge of the nursing uh, profession. And we're very excited for your committee and your board. Thank you. Okay, hearing no comments, um, I would ask the moderator to please open it to public um, comments, please. We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment. Please remember you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in. I would like to make a comment. Uh, real quick, this is Reza uh, before we see with that comment. Um, I, I noticed in the chat box that uh, Ms. Vogan says she, she didn't get her two full minutes and, and she wanted to um, maybe follow up. Uh, I would ask that we do the public comments for this item 9.0. And then when that's concluded, um, maybe we can go back briefly uh, to Ms. Vogan to see if there's anything else left. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I think you were going to call on Dr. Dittmer. Dr. Stephanie Dittmer would like to make a comment. One second, please. Go yes, ahead, thank Dr. You. Yes, thank you. I would like to know if the um, information that will be presented and reports presented at the next impact meeting regarding the OPS will include any of the evaluation of the current literature and publication of 2022 made to this point regarding standard of care practices, clinical outcomes. The information that is reviewed has to do with the, the examination programs of the various certifying organizations. So that is the information that will be in the reports to the extent that the detail is released will be contingent upon the non-disclosure agreements. So you will see the occupational analysis report for California, that will be a public document but the reports, um, the psychometric reviews um, will be limited to what can be publicly disclosed based upon the respective non-disclosure agreements. But again, they are focused solely on those certification examination programs. There's, it's not an extensive review of the literature. We were charged with looking at those programs and determining whether or not the exams um, met certain psychometric uh, standards. Thank you. Chelsea Roca would like to make a comment. One second, please. Go ahead, Ms. Roca. And the analysis by OPES was trying to answer, is it whether these board certifications that we have currently are adequate enough to allow for independent practice? Um, thank you. Yes, that's part of the review. So would they be suitable for use um, in how in the intent of how the bill was written do they do they meet those particular psychometric standards and can be used in the california process i'm sorry can i can i intervene um this is edward ray uh i couldn't hear that 
uh, speaker's question. It, it seemed to start mid sentence. Is it possible to repeat that question? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, my question was just what what was the question that the OPES analysis was trying to answer and whether or not it was if the board certification um, that we take uh, as new grads is adequate enough for to practice independently. OK, thank you. Uh, this is Reza. I'll, I'll just add to Tracy's answer to that question. Um, if you want, again, I always try to refer to the original uh, authority business and professions code section 2837.105 subdivision a especially subdivision a2 says the board together with the office of professional examination services shall assess the alignment of the competencies tested in the national nurse practitioner certification examination required by subparagraph A of paragraph one of subdivision A of section 2837.103 with the occupational analysis performed according to paragraph one. And then subdivision A4 states, if the assessment performed according to paragraph two identifies additional competencies necessary to perform the functions specified in subdivision C of section 2837.103, pursuant to that subdivision that are not sufficiently validated by the National Nurse Practitioner Board Certification Exam, dot 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 the board shall identify and develop a supplemental exam that properly validates identified competencies so summarizing that the the, the work that um, Tracy's team is doing is to evaluate the competencies that are tested under current national certification exams and evaluating whether those competencies um, uh, whether those exams sufficiently test for the competencies that would be necessary to safely and successfully perform the, the functions that under AB 890 NPs will able, be able to practice without standardized procedures. So again, 2837.105 of the Business Professions Code is where you can go to um, read that. Thank you, Ms. Roca. Uh, there are no other public requests for comments. Did we want to let Sharon Bogan finish up um, first? Sorry. Yes, and I'll just say real quick, um, Ms. Bogan, uh, there was no, hopefully understood that there was no intent to limit your time or cut you off. As you know, we have a two minute time limit. Um, you, you may have not been speaking for two minutes, but your questions prompted a pretty lengthy discussion from uh, staff and the committee uh, about the process. And I, I think we concluded that item around 145, 150. And so I, I think that was that was um, part of the consideration and needing to move on. But um, I see you've typed in a comment. Maybe just uh, we can give her a brief moment to um, express her, her kind of final sentiments on that. Go ahead, Ms. Bogan. Oh, well, it's in the box. Um, we, we can move on. I just, I just wanted to acknowledge that we all know that even intent is not written in the law. You know, the committee members need to understand the intent and uh, look at the law, and you know, keep personal opinions, um, you know, aside. And so, I just, I just wanted to remind everybody of that. Um, just because there are certain things that we all know are true, even though they're not written. So, um, I just wanted to. You know, just say that, but that's all. Thanks, you guys. Just, just go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Committee Chair Gamble. Far, there are no other public requests for comment. Would you like me to close this window? One yes. question. One question. May I ask a question related to a question from Dr. Detamir? Yes, um, I would like to, however, close the public comment uh, section first, Dr. Espinoza, and then I will allow you to speak. Yes, moderator, please close uh, public comments at this time. Dr. Espinoza, the floor is yours for your comment. Thank you. Uh, just real quickly, um, Dr. Dittermeyer, I mean, she, uh, she's been very active in previous um, presentations um, throughout this whole process. So I had a question for the committee. I think um, I 
didn't hear if, how lengthy she was referring to inform, uh, but recent information on some updates on clinical trials or whatever that the, she was saying specifically. But I think we all heard it. But is it possible that uh, OPS, just for informational only, not necessary that say, okay, though, but maybe there's something there significant that might be worth OPS uh, looking at. Um, if she has that information, if uh, Dr. Tamir has that, and if it can be forwarded to all of us, to the committee uh, for looking at that to see if there's anything, it might help us have some comments when we do have the review of OPS. Uh, if she has that and would like to send it to us either through public comment, but I, I I think it would be worth OPS to look at that if it's a very concise thing, not a review of everything, um, but and for us to review. Uh, Dr. Espinoza, and uh, correct me if I'm not, if I'm incorrect, Reza, um, uh, after Reza wrote the specific statute as it relates to 2837.105, he read the purpose, and one of those was, I guess they did interviews. I don't know if that restricts them from looking at any clinical um, research. Um, but of course, if any member of the public would like to share information with us as it relates to any specific agenda item um, and have it disseminated to all of us, they can always send that information to impact at dca.ca.gov. So I would welcome uh, on your behalf and on the committee's behalf for Dr. Dittmer to send that information if she has any clinical studies or any information or anyone who's on this call to share information with us regarding any agenda item. Um, Reza, do you have anything additionally to say about the clinical research aspect of the OPOS? Um, no, I think you said it well. I'll, well, I, briefly, I'll just say um, the Business Professions Code 2837.105 uh, merely says that OPES is to perform an occupational analysis and to do an assessment of the competencies and whether additional competencies are necessary. It's not real specific in terms of, you know, it doesn't direct OPES to do interviews or review certain types of data. It's it's not real specific in prescribing how that occupational analysis and that assessment is to occur. Um, Tracy's group, Tracy is the you know, expert in, in, in that type of work. And um, we, you know, respect her judgment on on um, uh, kind of laying out the, the, the method, methodology for that. Um, but I, I don't think there's anything that prescribes that they um, cannot look at this or that. I think uh, your suggestion, Samantha, was was a good one for the document to be, I, I'm not sure what the document was. I, I didn't quite catch it. And, um, but uh, it can be forwarded to NPAC at dca.ca.gov and then shared with Tracy's group and the rest of the committee. And, um, you know, we, we will defer to Tracy's expertise and judgment as to whether it's, you know, to what degree it's relevant and ought to kind of be, um, you know, made, made part of that review. Yes, and we'd be happy to do that. So once you receive the document, I'll make sure that we review it if it's relevant to the specific purpose of this study. Um, you know, we can incorporate it as needed. Otherwise, again, it may be helpful for other aspects of your, your process uh, related to this um, endeavor. Thank you, Dr. Espinoza, for your um, question. Um, and so now um, we are going to go out of order again. Thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Montez, for your presentation as well. We appreciate your time as well as Ms. Hogan's as well. Thank you. Um, we will now move out of order. And considering um, the time is now 2.05, um, I'd like to do agenda item eight, another information only um, just so that we can have that information as it kind of pertains to what we've been discussing currently as it relates to the regulatory package of AB 890, as well as the Department of Com uh, uh, Consumer Affairs, OPES, and uh, the potential of looking at and just keeping an eye on um, 
Senate Bill 1375 and Assembly Bill 2684 as it relates to uh, our current um, uh, implementation of AB 890. Um, and with that being said, I will hand it over to um, the moderator to introduce our speaker. It's actually, um, Mark, I'll go ahead and take that. Um, and if uh, you want to elevate Marissa, she can jump in if um, she wants to add any additional information, which is she usually does, and it's very, very helpful. Um, so there are two bills right now in this legislative session. Um, there were three, AB 852 was a third one, um, but that no longer focuses on nurse practitioners. And so what typically occurs is um, bills are introduced and passed. And um, if there are items that weren't able to be um, agreed upon and move forward, um, they may be attempted to be updated in a subsequent legislative session. If um, a bill passes, becomes laws, and as they're being implemented, additional um, concerns or questions come up around that where there, there is a need to provide additional information, then again, uh, another bill would be introduced with that language to address that. And so that is what occurred in this legislative session to respond to the implementation of AB 890 and also to respond to current events that are occurring in our nation. And so the first bill is SB 1375, and that is a bill that was introduced that um, addresses nurse practitioner um, practice. And then AB 2684 is another bill um, that is actually our BRN Sunset Bill, um, and there are many, many cleanup items in that one as well, in particularly around furnishing um, that uh, addresses, you know, nurse practitioner practice. Um, I will pause on the update of those really quick, and I'll actually defer to Marissa to give a quick outline of both of those bills um, and give her some time to prepare to do that as I continue to speak. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to let the committee know is that these are bills. These are not laws yet. And um, until they are signed by the governor, um, anything can happen to them. They can be vetoed. There can be amendments up to and including until he um, puts pen to paper. So the board does nothing in preparation of implementing them in this stage because it could be a vastly different bill by the time it um, comes to fruition. We saw that with AB 852 being introduced that addressed um, transition to practice, it addressed fee authority for the board, it addressed issuing certifications for um, the 103 NP, et cetera. And that bill no longer exists in that state. That bill was um, a gut and amend and is now a pharmacy only um, bill and no longer affects the Nurse Practice Act. So it went from a direct impact bill to an indirect or a no impact bill. And so we have been, as a board, watching SB 1375 and AB 2684. We've been active in um, uh, the board's support and support with amendments um, and having discussions underneath the board's position um, to move this forward. And um, one of the discussions was around implementation and would, if this, these one or both of these bills passed, hopefully both of them, our board has supported, bo supported both bills. If both of those bills pass, would it affect the current, um, implement, current movement of the regulatory package that is in place? And the answer is no. The um, decision to move forward with the AB 890 regulations that are currently in text um, was made and um, as to allow for January 1 to come and access to that additional expanded scope would be available. And so pulling a regulatory package back and changing the direction of it based on bills or um, new law would not really serve the purpose of getting access to care. So this package as is has the full intent to move forward as written 
without any consideration really to these new bills that are out here that may pass. Now, once they pass, currently both bills do not have an urgency clause. And I have not necessarily even seen a delay, uh, a delayed implementation in there, but Marissa will be able to speak to that as well. Um, so these as currently written should go into effect January 1. If on January 1, the board needs to do something to make sure that we are now following the law that is created by passing these two bills, we have several options that we can do within regulations. And that is repeal sections that may not be of effect anymore. One of the bills does directly address the transition to practice. And if there is no longer a transition of practice that needs to be defined by the board, we can repeal that section and move forward with what's in the business profession code. We do not have to change the uh, momentum that is behind this regulatory package as is. Um, and so just to provide that example of um, we can update a regulation, we can add a regulatory section, we can repeal sections. Um, that have been put forward because we cannot predict what new law might come about um, based on um, updated bills and updated law that comes from the bills after they are passed. So I will now um, open the floor up to Marissa so that she can speak on SB 1375. We'll have that opened up for discussion if there's any discussion. Then we will move to discussion around AB 2684 um, let her give a little presentation on that and then have um, it open for discussion and then we'll go out to one public comment period. Again, this is information only, so it does not require a motion or a second or a vote. Thank you. Marissa? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm super excited to be joining you for the first time. And Lori really covered a lot of the important parts, but I'll give you just kind of a brief overview. Um, at this point in legislative session, we are getting close to the end. The board is still tracking approximately 25 bills that are still in play at the second year of a two year session. And these two we thought would be of most interest to the committee, which is why we pulled them out. So Senate Bill 1375 is authored by Senate Pro Tem Atkins and it's co-authored by Assembly Member Wood, who also authored AB 890. And there's also, I wanna say approximately 10 or 11 other co-authors, both senators and, and assembly members. So it's a fairly popular bill. Um, Status-wise, it's currently on its third reading on the assembly floor, so it's pretty far in the process. And as Lori mentioned, the bill is going to address two main parts. One is going to be abortion by aspiration for nurse practitioners and certified nurse midwives. And the second would be that transition to practice requirement that was in AB 890. Um, so in terms of the abortion by aspiration, what this bill would do is it would expand the training options for nurse practitioners and certified nurse midwives who are seeking to perform abortions by aspirations in terms of what trainings they can take to be determined competent to perform those procedures. It would also clarify that an independent NP, um, as outlined within AB 890, can perform those procedures without physician supervision. And then for the transition to practice requirement, it would remove the requirement for us to define minimum standards in our regulations, as Lori had mentioned. And it would also authorize a nurse practitioner to apply prior practice experience that was completed in California towards that requirement that is outlined in 890. Um, and as was mentioned, the board did take a support position on the bill at their June 23rd meeting. Are there any questions around SB 1375 before she moves on to AB 2684? Uh, just real quickly. So the issue on a transition to practice. So it what how does it ex expand it or it removes it or so currently right now when AB 890 was passed part of the language said the board would define in regulations the transition to practice that is what the subcommittee that focused on implementation of the point 101 or the transition to practice focused on and that is what the language currently does this bill is currently a bill. It is not a law. So we have nothing that we need to address here in this committee yet. When or if this bill passes and if it is in its current state, this bill will remove the board from defining and regulation the transition of practice and would defer to what is in statute. 
Um, and therefore, the language that the board has put forward in this current regulatory package, we would then repeal and not define the transition of practice and what needs to occur in order for that to happen. Um, again, that is secondary. That is not something that um, we even need to dive into in this current meeting because this is a bill and it is not law and we do not have to address anything in that today. We just wanted to let you guys know that this is on the horizon and if it does pass in its current form, that is the intention is to remove the board's regulations around transition of practice. Um, the additional thing is the abortion by aspiration. That is a, a, a big item um, that is going around in um, the nation right now. And um, currently nurse practitioners and nurse midwives have the ability in the Nurse Practice Act to perform abortions by aspiration, but that has to be done through defined training um, specific to providers that can provide that training. And it has to be done under physician supervision by utilizing a standardized procedure. We know um, through this committee that AB 890 created a 103 NP and a 104 NP that are not required to utilize standardized procedures or have specific physician oversight. So in order to allow those providers to be able to perform aspiration by abortion, it has carved out that those two new providers do not need to do a standardized procedure and they do not need to have physician oversight in order to perform the aspiration abortion. It also expanded the people that can train this procedure so that we have greater access in California and more providers that can um, provide this service to our population. Okay, it looks like there's no comments on that. Marissa, would you like to move on to AB 2684, please? Of course. So as was mentioned, AB 2684 is our sunset bill. Um, and it is authored by Assemblymember Berman, along with co-authors Senator Roth and Assemblymember Irwin. In terms of where it is in the process, it's currently in the Senate Appropriations Committee on the suspense file. Um, the suspense hearing for the Appropriations Committees should be held this Thursday. So we'll soon be getting an update on if this will be moving to the floor. And it is a very substantive bill, um, so I won't go through everything in it, but I'll highlight just kind of a key, a few key provisions that may be interesting. Um, one, it would extend the sunset date for the board to January 1, 2027. So that would extend the board's authority to continue operating in its current form for four more years. Uh, it would codify the board's current nursing education and workforce advisory committee, um, which is already existing, just not in statute permanently. So this would place that NEWAC committee, as we refer to it, in statute, and thereby make it mandatory that we continue to meet and convene. Um, it would also establish a minimum of 500 direct patient care clinical hours with a minimum of 30 hours in each nursing area specified by the board. And this would help to clarify the board's current regulations, which at the moment state that 75% of clinical hours in a course must be in direct patient care, but doesn't provide clear guidance as to the minimum number of hours required. So we're hoping this will simplify if it makes it into the final version. Um, the current version also would authorize the board to issue a furnishing number to a nurse practitioner or a certified nurse midwife in an initial application as an alternative to a separate application. So the idea here is to allow the board to combine the initial application process for NPs and CNMs so that they don't have to submit a separate application or a separate fee in order to request a furnishing number, which we hope will kind of take down some of the administrative burden as well as the cost burden on our applicants. Um, it also deletes the statutory fee minimums throughout the Nurse Practicing Act, excuse me, Nursing Practices Act. Um, and so this would actually allow the board to adjust fees down past the current statutory minimums where appropriate, um, which again will allow us to drop if there's any costs that we find just don't kind of warrant the workload or we want to reduce for our applicants, that gives us authority to do so. Whereas before we were held to a certain minimum. And lastly, as was touched upon quite a bit, it makes various changes in code cleanup related to implementing um, AB 890 and the new 103, 104 provisions. 
And so at their June 23rd meeting, the full board took a support if amended position, and we've been having really productive conversations with legis legislative staff and stakeholders, and are anticipating another round of amendments uh, will be published soon. Um, so looking forward to those. Any questions around um, AB 2684, the BRN Sunset Bill? There is um, quite a lot of um, furnishing number cleanup. Um, Dr. Ray, they did address your decomposing patient versus your decompensating patient in our Sunset Bill. Um, so that has been uh, cleaned up as well. And um, really, it, it also, in some of the conversations we did notice uh, through this committee, that um, there was fee authority given for the 104 NP, but there was not fee authority given for the 103 NP. Um, and that was um, corrected in the sunset bill as well. So there are several sections throughout this bill that does address the implementation of AB 890 and um, allows for um, these changes to kind of move forward. And um, if there's any questions or clarification, we're, we're here and happy to have a discussion around it. Eel Melby, I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew who um, Ms. Marissa Clark was and that she is the Chief Legislative Officer for the BRN. I think I failed to mention that. Welcome, Ms. Clark. I'm sorry. I apologize. No, I just wanted to make sure everybody knew who you were. Thank you. Nice to meet everyone. She's a wonderful addition to the BRN that's been a vacant position for way too long. Um, and she, uh, we're just so happy to have her as part of our team. She's taking quite a load off of um, the uh, executive team here. And um, hopefully she chooses to stick around for a while. Um, <laughs> and we don't chase her off. <laughs> um, it, it doesn't seem like there's many comments right now. This is information only. So Samantha, if there's no comments, you can't open up for public comment. Thank you, uh, moderator. I will ask for you to open up to public comment, please. We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment. Please remember, you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Dr. Stephanie Dittmer would like to make a comment. One second, please. Yes, thank you. In regards to the sunset bill, I had specific concerns regarding ensuring that the board that is supposed to under section now section 11 section C3, the board shall annually collect, analyze, report information related to the number of clinical placement slots that are available in the location of those clinical placement slots within the state. This is referring to the 500 clinical hours, and this is actually a known problem within the educational system for nurse practitioners of having adequate locations, resources, and supervised um, clinical rotations where they have to find their own clinical rotations, um, sometimes at their own cost and not within a standardized um, model at any given institution that is um, saying they're educating them. So it's concerning to me that there's no wording in the sunset bill that actually provides not just tallying the information, but actually enforcing that that's actually part of the standard of education as it is for those of us that practice medicine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dittmer. I'll actually respond to that. The 500 direct patient care hours in our sunset bill is actually towards the pre-licensure nursing program. And so that's the students that are not RNs that are going to receive education to become a um, initial RN, not the advanced practice RN. The advanced practice RN um, uh, education requirements are in a different section. Um, and those are specifically addressed in um, 16 CCR, California Code of Reg Regulations, um, 1484. And in 1484, currently right now, it is five at 500 is the minimum amount of direct patient care hours that um, supervised direct patient care hours that a nurse practitioner can have. 
Um, there is new recommendations that have come out from NOMP, and that is the um, nurse practitioner organization that kind of gives a nationwide recommendations toward education preparation for nurse practitioners, and they've increased that number. Um, and so we are looking at implementing um, those recommendations through a regulatory update later on. Um, in response to the comment on uh, nurse practitioners finding their own clinical and preceptorship, um, that should not be occurring. It is actually currently in our regulations that the school find the nurse practitioner clinical rotations, the preceptorships. And if it is found on review that a California board approved nurse practitioner program is not abiding by that, the nursing education consultant that's assigned to that school can hold them in, an, in a non-compliance with the current law and bring them in front of our board for our board to determine what the next steps are. Additionally, we do have out-of-state nurse practitioner programs that do um, their preceptorship or clinical rotation within California if the nurse that is in their program is currently residing in California and licensed as an RN in California. And the requirement is they have to meet those same standards that the in-state California programs do up to and including that that school or academic institutions find that nurse practitioner student their clinical um, oversight or preceptorship um, for them. It should not be on the onus of the nurse practitioner student. It is the onus of the program and that is currently in our law. Thank you. Um, Dr. Dimmer has a follow-up question. Would you like me to? Yes, that's okay. It is actually a statement that I, as well as other physicians, receive these types of requests on a regular basis. So thank you for addressing this. Yeah, that's correct. We hear that as well. Um, a lot of nurse practitioner students, nurse midwife students will kind of do their own um, search to try to get a preceptor that they choose and they want um, separate from the school. However, it is still the school's responsibility to do that. Um, and so uh, if there is an institution that is found that is pushing this off onto their student and um, making them do this footwork without the school doing it, um, that is an area of concern. And I hope that it is reported up to us. Thank you. Committee Chair Gamble's far. There are no other public requests for comment. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, moderator, please close the window. Okay, we have two more agenda items. Um, they're both, I think we should go with agenda item 6.0 first. Um, what do you think, EO Melby? Um, I think the second one will be the the, the shorter one. Um, <laughs> so, um, I'm sure, did we, uh, we, I think we have three agenda items. I think we have to approve the minutes and approve the dates. Um, and still do the NMAC, NPAC terms. But yes, we, um, can, we can just take the whole meeting in, in backwards. We can go okay. 976 um, and, and go backwards instead of forwards. It's all good. Well, we already did the minutes, oh, so we okay. we're, we're fine there. Yeah, we just have two. We have um, the meeting dates and the um, impact terms. So um, considering our November meeting will be pretty but I would like to start with agenda item 6.0 because I think that will be the next pressing thing that we'll need to discuss. So agenda item 6.0 is regarding the impact uh, members terms of office as specified in the updated impact charter. That charter was sent as part of the meeting materials um, that specifies uh, specifically um, the membership in accordance with the 287, 2837, dot 102 B um, the comp how we're comprised of four MPs two physicians and one public member and thus states that the all appointments shall be a term of um, four years and all vacancies should be filled for the unexpired term um, the initial appointments however uh, that includes the members of this specific impact committee as it's formulated right now um, 
the following terms shall be two of the four, shall be licensed NPs, shall serve a term of four years. One licensed NP shall serve a term of three years, and the remaining NP shall, shall, shall serve a term of two years. One of the two physicians, uh, surgeons, shall serve a term of three years years and the other cell uh, should have a term of four years and then our public member uh, shall serve four years. So in um, as we are coming to the close of this year, even though it's still August, uh, but planning ahead, um, we would like to have a discussion and ask um, the members of this committee um, exactly what process or how we would like to determine um, who shall serve what. And I will turn some of this information over to EO Melby just to get better clarification to make sure that we are within regulations as well as Reza as well. Thank you so much. Um, so when we started looking at the advisory committees, we did notice that there was one advisory committee that was previously formed that did not have staggered um, term limits for the initial appointment. And um, once everybody met their four years, the entire committee was to term out and then it would have to then reestablish an entire new committee. We do not want that to happen. It is always good to have continuity and continued membership so that the um, more seasoned committee members could mentor the um, newer members and really provide for some stable um, guidance and movement and not to lose any momentum that's already there. So we mirrored our business professions code that was utilized when the board after being sunset um, sunrise. Uh, and so they staggered the initial terms of that um, board committee, board members, sorry. And um, we have now mirrored that with each one of our advisory committees. So the APRN committee has a staggered um, membership. The NEWAC committee has a staggered, staggered membership. And Mac and and PAC both have a staggered membership. And in fact, we took the vote at the end Mac committee to do the exact same thing that we're doing here today. Um, and so we were able to um, vary the terms. In the end Mac committee, there was concern that the terms might be too short. So I want to provide additional clarification that in the charter, it is for four years, and then you can serve an additional four years. So the ones that would choose to go down to three years, you have the potential to serve in here for seven years. You're not limited to three years because you can reappoint for your second term. Um, if for those of you guys that are choosing to go to the two year term, again, that's six years that you can absolutely serve on um, this committee. Um, currently, we are still under the provisions of Bagley Keene that allow us to meet remotely. Um, it will go until July of next year. July 1st is when it expires. And in the absence of any new legislation, it will go back to in-person. Um, so the hope uh, from our board, at least, is to continue to um, see new legislation introduced and passed so that we can continue these virtual uh, meetings. We do have a great turnout each and every time um, we do this versus in-person. Um, so what uh what is said for the public member betha is that you would continue on a four-year term and be reappointed for another four years if you choose to stay again understand that any of these terms um, can absolutely be ended if the um, member chooses to resign the position so you are not tied to us um, or handcuffed to us for these eight years however um, i know that uh, we as the BRN staff would love you guys to all stay on um, and really become incredibly proficient in this and knowledgeable and move all these issues through as quickly as possible with a lot of really, really wonderful input on that. So the longer you stay, I think the better it is for, for all of us. So with that, the public member is decided. And so we can open it up to the two um, physician surgeon members one of the physician sur surgeon member would do three years and one would do four years. And so I would open this up to discussion right now between Dr. Ray and Dr. Espinosa. Um, is there a preference for one of you guys to serve three or four years? 
that would mean that you guys have the ability to serve for seven years or a total of eight years, um, bar knowing that at any point you guys could resign, but that is your maximum amount that you would serve. And so um, between on uh, Dr. Espinosa and Dr. Ray, if you guys have a preference, please let us know. So can I ask a quick question um, in regards to that? So I was a little unclear on who who actually chooses the NPAC members then. Is it the board? They vote on the member in the membership? Yes. Um, the way that the NPAC and NMAC was set up was the board to appoint. Okay. So um, that does have to happen. But you guys have been appointed. So for this initial term, you guys can choose your term limit um, right. if you want to drop down. So if let's say either Dr. Espos, Espinosa or I want to be reappointed or anyone else on this committee for that matter, we just express the fact that we want to have a second term and then the BRN votes on it. Are there, are there other members, I mean, other people in the community say they want that position that they can kind of have a primary or however that works? How does that, how does that work? The way that the board membership does, and this is what we would mirror, is that, um, you would continue in that reappointment unless you told us that you did not want to. Um, the other option would be is if you guys were not doing your duty um, as an advisory committee member, the board could then um, talk about how they would um, appoint somebody else into your position. Um, but that that is not a typical happening, but yes, that absolutely could happen. Um, we would not, if, if there is a current member that is wishing to continue into the second term and there has been no wrongdoings or uh, anything of that person or and they are continuing to serve in their role appropriately, we would not open that up to another person at that point. Um, we would wait for that second term to expire the same that we do for our board members. Okay. So my other question then is follow up on that is if if we if one of us has a three year term say, and then we want to stick around for a second term, does that next term then become four years? So total of seven. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it would always be four years after this initial term. Got it. So the maximum number that both you or Dr. Espinosa can serve going forward, one would serve seven years, one would serve eight years. Oh, eight years. Okay. Because hmm. mm -hmm. it'd be two four-year terms if you choose to be the four-year physician in the initial term. I, I have a question. I'm sorry. It, so right now, currently, how what is it? Right now, there is no term limit set because the charter varies, um, and this is what we're doing right now. So, oh, okay. Dr. Espinosa, if you choose to do three years followed by a four-year, or a four-year followed by a four-year. Um, based on your preference, if there is no opposition to that by Dr. Ray, you can serve seven years or eight years. It would be up to you. But uh, potentially, one, uh, both of us can serve seven years if we did four year, uh, four year, and the next one three year, then or and the other one three year, and the next one four years. So both no, seven. Let me years. clarify: the second term and every subsequent term will always be four years. It is only this initial one that would be three or four. There is no alternating or trading. Um, the initial term, the intent is to stagger so that when we appoint a new physician surgeon into the position that is vacated after seven years, that the physician surgeon that has been in place for the previous seven years has a one year overlap so that that uh, mentoring can occur. Um, I, you know, I don't have a strong preference. I, I hope to stick around for a while, but, um, you know, in all fairness, I would be okay with like flipping a coin or something to see if one of us gets a three-year term and a four-year term, because I, I think, you know, both of us are interested in contributing. I agree. Okay. Um, does anybody have a coin to flip? Is Reza, is Reza there? Can he be the official arbiter? Reza, do you want to flip the coin? <laughs> they call it. I don't have a coin if you want to hold on i can go grab one or i can uh ask siri to give me a random number maybe that's See, another google has a random number generator you can use let's that. do google with the siri with this will be an interesting whatever experience awesome. okay um so just be using my iphone here um i guess uh 
maybe let's say even or odd. Um, one of you wants to. I'll let Dr. Make... Espinosa call it. <laughs> I. Dr. Espinosa is called odd. Okay, so if it is an odd number, then we'll give Dr. Espinosa the four year term. Is that how we'll Correct. do it? Okay. Hey, Siri, give me a random number. I'm not able to see that. Reza. Oh, sorry. Uh, it picked 72. Can you 70, see it? It's an even number. Okay. For transparency, I'm trying to show. Uh, so, Dr. Ray, I think, gets the four year term. Yes. Uh, Dr. Espinoza, the three-year initial term. Thank you so much. Uh, of course, so, it gets, uh, I guess. <laughs> yep, yeah. Siri got you on that one. So thank you guys so much for that. And then, so now it'll come down to the four NPs. There will be two of the NPs that will continue for four years and then have the ability to be reappointed for an additional four years. That would be eight years in total. One would have three years with an additional four years. It would be seven years in total. And one that would be two years with an additional four years, which would be six years in total. So I will open this up to discussion between Jan, Kevin, Sally, and Samantha. Do either of the four of you guys have a preference? Um, I would like to. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Sally. I was wondering if we should pick numbers too. If you well, guys have I a preference, we would like to honor the preference first. If there are ones that cannot decide, then yes, we can go to um, choosing numbers the same way. I will. Uh, I would like to be considered for the four-year term. Okay. Is there anybody else who would like to be considered for the four-year term? I would too. Oh, that's you, Sally. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Kevin or Jan, are you guys interested in a four year or are you guys okay with a three or a two? I think I'm okay. Go ahead. I was gonna say I would be okay with a three or a two. Either one of those would be fine with me. Okay, and Kevin? And I can flip a coin with Jan or do a random number for the three or the two, either one. Wonderful, so Samantha and Sally, you guys are set at four years. Kevin and Jan, if you guys are interested in, in a three or a two, if either of you guys have a stronger preference, please let that know. If not, we will rely on Reza to do an odd or even even random number grab to see who gets the three years. Let me let me ask a question here. If I'm understanding it correctly, um, accepting the two year position means a two year and then a four year. So Correct. it's actually a six year position. It is. Yes. Okay. I think, honestly, given my age, that probably um, the two-year term is a better uh, fit for me, uh, unless that's something that Dr. Maxwell wants. I can go with a three. Sounds okay. great. So, uh, Samantha, we would have to make a motion to accept the term limits. Jan would be the initial term of two years, followed with the ability to reappoint for four Kevin, initial year of three years, following with the ability to reappoint for four. Samantha, four years, can reappoint with four. Sally, four years, can reappoint with four. Dr. Ray, four years, can reappoint with four. Dr. Espinosa, three years, can reappoint with four. And Betha, four years, and can reappoint with four. Um, if you guys want to accept that as a motion, that would be great. We would need a first and a second. You may, uh, I have a correction. You said uh, one for four, the three can come in for the, for, it's supposed to be three and three, correct? No, it is three and then four. Oh, okay. Every term after this initial term is four years. So Dr. Espinosa plan to be with us for seven years. Okay. All right. And then Dr. Ray will plan to be with us for eight years. Okay. 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 Assuming I get reappointed. Yes. <laughs> but don't do anything to screw up. No, I'm joking. Or that you <laughs> want to be reappointed. <laughs> yes. And at any point, anybody is able to resign. Um, the ask is to give us some notice so that we can go back out and advertise, get that out to our board members so that they can review the applications received and fill the vacant position. Hopefully, 
right before you become vacant or right as you become vacant so that there is no lapse in that position and that valuable input. Um, so we do ask for um, some time, but if that is not possible, we're, we're, we're absolutely okay to move forward. This is a seven member committee. We do require five to meet a quorum, um, but we do want to try to keep as close to seven members at all times as possible. Uh, E.O. Melby, I think Betha had a statement, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Betha. Hello. I just wanted to say, first of all, that uh, I'm filled with gratitude for the opportunity, and thank you. I also agree that a little more time makes us only better at this. Um, I feel like I'm just now getting a hang of processes. So thank you, and I would like to make a motion to uh, approve this. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second, Ed. Wonderful. Um, board moderator, we'll go out to public comment. We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment. Please remember, you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. By the way, this is Reza while we wait. Just a real minor quick correction. If I heard you, Lori, I think you said a quorum is five. I think I um, mistakenly may have said that this morning in our NMAC meeting, I, I, I don't know. But anyways, just to correct that, that's four is the majority of seven and you probably were just had it in your head because I may have um, got that wrong this morning. So I apologize. Anytime I could blame an error on you, Reza, <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> Thank just you do it anytime. <laughs> Sharon Bogan would like to make a comment. One second, please. Go thank ahead, you. Ms. Bogan. Oh, thank you. Um, I just, I need to strongly object to these eight year term limits. Um, the, uh, we really need, first of all, we need, um, you know, we, we can't keep a stagnant idea pool sitting there. We need people who are actually um, involved in what nurse practitioners, outpatient nurse practitioners are doing um, with their new ideas, fresh ideas. Um, second of all, it provides fair and competitive elections which is, you know, what America is all about. Um, and also, if someone's in there and they know they're in there for a shorter time period, they're going to be more focused on what they want to get done. You know, if someone has eight years, you know, even if they don't think it'll happen to them, subconsciously, their mind's just going to be like, oh, well, you know, we can talk about that at the next meeting or, you know, they're just not going to make it a priority to uh, really get what needs to be done, done. Um, I also um, I also need to object to the fact that we have a surgeon and not just a surgeon who's inpatient all the time, but actually a specialist who doesn't even work with primary care um, surgeries. Um, and, you know, he, uh, with all due respect, he, he's not out there in the outpatient world. He's not out there with dealing with the patients that we're dealing with who really need us, who really need access to care. He just, he doesn't know because he's not involved. And so I really want the board to think about the people that you're appointing to a nurse practitioner um, committee. Um, they really need to have an idea of what their decisions are affecting. Thank you. Can I respond to that <clears throat> since this was addressing me? If you'd like, you can. You do not need to feel obligated, though. Okay. Well, I mean, I just I want to make the statement that, um, you know, I work daily with nurse practitioners. Um, there's nothing in the charter or in the law that specified that the individuals on this committee had to be within the primary care realm. I would also make the argument that, um, my practice actually involves working very closely with vulnerable patients who come from backgrounds 
um, that are oftentimes marginalized. So I have a very deep respect and understanding of the difficulty that goes into caring for people who have difficult time getting access to good health care. So yes, I am a specialist, but I think making assumptions because of my specialty that I don't understand what goes into caring for vulnerable patients and people who come from underprivileged or other socioeconomic backgrounds, I think is incorrect. So I just want to I just want to put that out there. But I do appreciate the comments that people bring to this forum, and I think it's important that people remain engaged. But I want to assure anybody who has any preconceptions about who I am and what I do that I care very deeply about patients, even those who don't necessarily need my services. Thank you. Uh, and I'll just remind um, the, the public in general that similar comments were made at the outset when this committee was being formed uh, and the board heard those comments and chose to appoint Dr. Ray and the rest of the members of this committee. So um, that the feedback is is appreciated and um, noted, uh, but um, we're here now. Also, as far as the four year terms, that's again, that the, the comment is noted. Um, it, it, it again, once again, appreciated. The board members serve five year terms. It's not an unusual term length, four year terms. Uh, I understand there are, you know, pros and cons of, of any term length, but um, again, the, the term length has been considered. Um, there are pros to having individuals serve for four year terms as well, including the experience and getting used to these processes that are kind of um, not first nature uh, to most of us, et cetera. So, Um, I would like to make a comment. Um, I would like to thank all of the public comments, and I would like to thank all the members of this committee and the BRN for your service to the public. Um, all of us as healthcare providers, we are all interested in caring for those patients who may not have access to care, whether they're inpatient, outpatient, no matter what the patient population. And so service to our community comes in more than one way. And I am very thankful to be on this committee. I do not take what I do here for granted, um, nor does anybody else on this committee. And we are listening to um, your feedback as well. Um, and so with that, I would just like to thank everyone because sometimes this, it can be a very thankless job. So with that, I would like to thank the committee members, EO, Melby, and everybody who's on this call. And I also thank everyone who gives their public comments because it just solidifies me in wanting to work harder and more diligently for the members of my community. I have a question. May I speak? Yes, please, Dr. Espinoza. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I think we've all worked really hard. I think that, uh, I don't think anybody has taken this uh, committee at all for granted um, uh, at all. I know how serious all of us have, and I, I don't think time limits um, in this case, at least for now, it doesn't seem like, like um, you know, four years is a lot or three years is a lot. However, um, from the physician's point of view, um, I think that I would like to propose that the two physicians stay on for the four years. And, and if not, that's okay. I understand that. But I would say in terms of mentoring, that part won't be able to happen because of all the requirements that are for that we don't speak to each other. I think that uh, Dr. Edwards and myself have never spoken outside because of fear that it may be misconstrued. I think that um, particularly right now, I think that it's been very helpful to have to recognize that we have the length of time to be able to understand that. And I think that particularly these next uh, eight years or even 10 years, there's gonna be a lot of changes. And I think that it's important that there is that continuity. Um, and I think 
Uh, we have a good set of uh, people right now. I would like to see everybody stay for the fall. I don't see the advantage of the staggered at this point. Uh, uh, and maybe later on I see it differently, but I don't. So uh, I would like to see everybody at four years and at least the, the positions uh, continue to four years, uh, four year terms. Dr. Espinoza, the rationale for the staggering is so that the entire committee leaves and then we have a whole new committee that has to kind of go through the same process that we had to go through in the very beginning, learning the ropes. And so that's the premise of why the staggering is occurring. One of the things that uh, there seems to be a lot of discussion about eight years, your term is over in three or four years and then you have to reapply or you make that decision to reapply. And I think that offer, that opens, if I'm mistaken, uh, Reza or EOML be correct me, that allows other people an opportunity to then run for any position that is available, including the incumbent or anybody else who wants to potentially take the position if they're not uh, re, uh, reappointed. And so, I mean- So let me, let me, let me provide clarification with that, Samantha. The way that our board does it, and we are in alignment with the board, is if the board member wants to continue for the second term limit, term, and there is nothing that the appointing power sees that would be in opposition of that, that term limit is granted. So um, we would not open it back up unless the person that wants to serve for the second term decides not to or if they choose and say, yes, I want to do the second term on review, it is noted that they have not fulfilled their duties in this current role, then the board could choose at that point to open back up and put somebody in in that place. Um, but that, that would be at the um, decision of the board and any notification of a uh, vacancy or a slot that would need to be filled would go out through our board. Um, but the intention is, is that if the person that is serving on the committee um, is doing well and um, wants to continue, they can continue for the additional four years. Um, and then just for clarification, these charters have already been passed by our board. Our board has set these charters. And so these are the charters that are moving forward. Um, and uh, if there is some need to, to look at them, we are trying to look at them as a whole. That means if we adjust NPAC, we would bring it back to adjust NEWAC, APRN, and NMAP. Um, the four advisory groups serve in the same exact capacity, providing recommendations to our board. We do not want to vary um, for just the purpose of having a smooth uh, running business, essentially and not showing favoritism. So um, today's NMAC committee, there are two board, two committee members that are physician surgeons, and one of them took a three year and one of them took a four year, so they can both serve um, seven or eight years identically to this. Um, and so we are not doing anything that is unusual or out of the norm or not equitable. Um, so just wanted to let that know. We are one minute from being at the time, um, I believe, uh, our limit, right? We were supposed to end at three, is that correct? Yes, and I believe we have one more public comment uh, that I think- We do so. have one more public comment, and then there's no vote. So we could, if you guys choose, go on and um, quickly approve the uh, schedule, or we can do that offline and send it out through email and get, um, just kind of manage it how we've managed by just- kind of getting forum and stuff going forward with that. So um, we'll open it up for the second public comment on here, please. We we have two public comments. Two more, please. Yes, Patty, Patty Gurney would like to make a comment. Go ahead, Ms. Gurney. Your service and your willingness um, to be on this very important committee. And I would just like to comment and request that the board um, submit uh, or have each candidate, whether they're up for reassignment um, or new, um, to the same uh, evaluation standard um, in order to make sure that uh, qualified candidates are not excluded from, um, from this uh, pool of, uh, of advisory. So I would just 
I would just request that the board um, consider that um, allowing uh, new applicants to um, to be uh, considered for expiring terms. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Stephanie Dittmere would like to make a comment. Second, please. Yes, thank you. I wanted to voice my specific um, appreciation for the lengthier time term limits that are being discussed because continuity across the time just with patient care as well as changing statutes and understanding the impact is very much important. And I would disagree with the previous um, public comment about um, the specialty of the physicians relating at all to what is, do, what is uh, occurring since we have nurse practitioners across all um, specialty services and as physician members, they are responsible for, for representing themselves as well as the entire profession, as well as the entire patient population. So I thank you all for your service. Thank you. Committee Chair Gambles, far there are no other public requests for comment. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, please. Thank you, moderator. We do have a motion on the floor um, and we had a first and a second. Um, and I'm going to call for the vote at this time. Um, Samantha Gambles, far aye. Dr. Edward Ray. Yes. Dr. Andrea Espinoza. Yes. NP Jan Johnson Griffin. Yes, yes. NP, Dr. Ma uh, Kevin Maxwell. I don't see him currently in the roster. Um, NP, Sally Pham. Yes. Um, Betha Schnell, public member. Yes. Okay, um, we have lost uh, Dr. Kevin Maxwell, but we still remain at quorum. And so uh, the- Samantha, uh, he had a hard stop at 3 p.m. Okay, okay, um, thank you. So we are able to continue forward to the next agenda item if you choose to, if the, board, if the committee agrees to go to the final agenda item, or we can notice that for a future meeting or um, handle it offline, that's perfectly fine. Um, I did want to address just um, some rules around public comment. Um, there are several items within our agenda that allows for public comment. The first one is public comment for items that are not on the agenda and request for future agenda items. That um, the only thing that a board member can do, or sorry, a committee member can do um, during that time is take that information into consideration and do a propose a vote um, or a motion to add that um, item to a future agenda. We are not able to, as a board, to um, communicate or have discussions around items that are brought up that are not agendaized. If there is discussion on an agendaized option, so um, 6.0 per se, um, the one that we just had up and we're, we're just talking about, that is an agendaized option. We can have a robust discussion about that. We do open it up to public comment. And because it is around this specific agenda item, it allows for the public member to have conversation with the board to get items addressed, to um, spark um, additional comment within the committee members to continue that conversation. Um, and that is the intent of it. So um, it was noticed in our uh, comment session um, that uh, some of the stakeholders were not happy about the discussion occurring during the public comment. Um, there is no time limit to public comment. Public comment, um, each person is allowed two minutes. We will give them that full two minutes, but the committee can discuss during this public comment anything that they choose to that is in relation and specific to the agenda item that is noticed. Um, that is what the input of that public commenter is. Additionally, in the uh, public comment opening that our board moderator does each time is 
what you're supposed to put into that public comment section. And that is to request to make a comment, or if there's a question, have that asked towards the board moderator. So I'm asking you guys in the public comment sessions to please utilize that with the utmost respect and follow the guidance that was put out. Um, negative comments and such put into a committee um, meetings, public chat will be addressed and um, that will not be accepted at all. Thank you. Thank you, E.O. Melby. Um, as the time is now 3.06, I wanted to check with my fellow committee members if they have time to conclude our final agenda item. Um, it is uh, 5.0 regarding meeting dates in 2023. Um, is there anyone who is opposed to carrying on and completing this agenda item? If so, we will um, end the meeting after that ob objection. Okay, hearing none, we will move forth with agenda item 5.0, our last and final agenda item regarding the meeting dates for 2023. Um, this was part of our um, supplemental materials in which the advisory committees were now scheduled um, to start meeting twice uh, yearly, in addition to any additional meetings that may be needed um, with adequate uh, public notifications. Um, and the two meeting dates that we see here are for March 2023 and September 2023, not withholding any additional meetings that may need to be called and um, noticed to the public. Um, opening discussions. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, you guys have been serving at four meetings a year. Um, that was specifically for the implementation of AB 890. Um, now that that is uh, essentially wrapping up, um, there is not a um, specific need for that um, to continue um, with that many meetings. That is the equal number that our board actually serves on for conducting businesses four meetings a year. So with the advisory committees, we did um, drop those down back to what is typically done. And what has been done in the past is two meetings per year. That does not preclude you guys from requesting an additional meeting. Um, and it does not stop the work of this committee. Um, as you guys are very familiar with the subcommittee process, you guys can form subcommittees of two um, and work on anything that you uh, deem necessary um, outside of these publicly noticed um, two meetings with the um, request that all of that work comes back and be reported out at the meeting so that the public is aware of um, what has been done, what will be done, the outcome of it, and the entire committee is able to put input and vote on it as a whole. Um, and so that is what is presented. Um, you guys are in alignment with the other advisory committees, as you can see on this agenda, on this um, agenda item calendar, sorry, um, it does have that the um, committees are all being held in uh, March and then they will all be held in September. Um, and so again, there it is equitable among all four of the advisory committees um, to do that. What I failed to mention in the NMAC committee, but I do want to make sure I mention here and I will make sure to follow up with the NMAC committee. Um, and let them know additionally is we will be doing one additional NPAC and MAC combo meeting in the spring of 2023. The reason for that combo meeting is to discuss the disciplinary guidelines because as they are being updated for and nurse practitioners and nurse midwives, um, the structure would be similar in nature. Um, and you, they would both be for advanced practice nurses who both have um, an independent practice and um, it's kind of the same issues that we'd be facing. So we want those amendments to be um, similar, if at all possible, to allow for ease. And then it also allows for um, the enforcement uh, uh, 
people to come in and speak to you guys and give you guys the same information to be able to make the same decisions so that one group doesn't feel like they heard something and another group did not. So we will be holding a third NPAC and MAC combination meeting in the spring. Date is to be determined. Um, we do plan on being a fairly lengthy meeting. Um, we would think it could be up to four hours um, for a robust discussion on um, really having the committee follow up on their recommendation for the disciplinary guidelines like you guys all voted on to do last year. So I just wanted to throw that out there. But if you guys are in agreement with this, um, we would like you to make a motion to accept the March and September time slot. And then you would work with your liaison, um, which is typically Ben McCauley Pusarens, um, to establish a specific date. Unless somebody has any specific request right now that they want to put out, um, that is the motion that is on the table to be um, a first and a second, if, if possible. Real quick clarification. So when would the NPAC and MAC combination happen? Again, I'm sorry. In the spring. In the spring. So aside from the meetings that are set up right now. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and Lori, are, are you, I know this came up during NMAC, are you looking to possibly coordinate the dates in, in um, those two months with the dates, the specific dates that the NMAC chose? It would be nice um, to do that. It, it does make it easy to have NMAC and NPAC on the same day, and then it frees up our board staff to not have to kind of pull that out. So yes, Reza, that would be a, a good idea. Um, should we put those dates out there? Yes. You have them off the top right. of your head. That would be great. I'm March 7th, I think. I know it was the second Tuesday of each of those I think it months. Was March seventh and September twelfth. If those dates work for you guys, that would be great. Yeah, I, I think um, if there's some reason why those dates don't work, I think there's room for for staff to um, work around that and and set up something that does. But if those dates are equally good as any other dates then that is, I think, the most efficient way, uh, so. Yeah, and that is the second Tuesday of each one of those months. So it says here, the March meetings in 23, where it says MPAC, MPAC meeting, those were those were already set up or will be set up. This is gonna be an additional one in March, an additional one in September? No, okay. this would be the meeting in March and the meeting in September. So NMAC voted this morning for March 7th and September 12th. If you guys are in agreement, then the motion would be, um, I accept the um, calendar as written and the NPAC would choose to meet on March 7th and September 12th, um, knowing that you know there is flexibility if something does come up that we could um, find a different date and ask for some flexibility and establish a quorum. I know two meetings that will be meeting and uh, 2023 and for NPAC will be combination ones. No, they would not. They're held on the same day. So this morning at uh, 9 a.m., we had an NMAC meeting that went from 9 until 11. Um, they too went 20 minutes over, like it looks like we will as well. Um, and then you guys started at 1, and um, hopefully we can wrap up around um, 3.20. Um, and you guys would be very similar, but that is how that has happened routinely throughout this entire year is NMAC and NPAC hold their meetings on the same day, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, but not together. We will have an additional third meeting that will be a combination meeting that will be sent out to you guys, and we will get a quorum, and that will be completely separate from this proposed schedule, specifically set aside to address disciplinary guidelines. Thank you. A uh, point that I'd like to make, uh, I know that the September 12th uh, meeting will be a problem for me at this point, um, but I would, we just would have six instead of seven. Okay. Yes, that sounds great. Thank you. EO Melby, I would like to make a motion to accept the meeting dates for 2023 
as stated of March 7th, 2023 and September 12th, 2023 uh, for the Nurse Practitioner Advisory Committee meeting. Time to be determined. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Jan Griffin, second. Thank you. Board moderator, we'll go out to public comment. Uh, we, will, we will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment. Please remember, you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give reminders or time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform me that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Committee Chair Gamble's far, there are no public requests for comment. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, moderator, please, and thank you. As there are no public comments, I'm going. I'm ready to ask for a vote. Um, Dr. Edward Ray? Yes. Dr. Andrea Espinoza? Yes. NP Jan Johnson Griffin? Yes. Uh, NP Dr. Kevin Maxwell has left the meeting. Uh, NP Sally Pham? Yes. Uh, and public member uh, Betha Schnell? Yes. Thank you. Um, as with quorum, the uh, meeting dates for 2023 have been passed as motioned previously. Oh, we have made it through all agenda items for today. Um, we have ran over. I appreciate the time, effort, and patience of our stakeholders and public members. I also appreciate all of the input and due diligence of not only our EO, Melby, Reza, our moderator, everyone at the BRN, but particularly the members on this impact committee. Um, I don't think that there is anything else to discuss, EO Melby. There is not, and just for official notice, you guys beat the time limit for NMAC. They adjourned at 23 after, and you guys are adjourning at 18 after. Good yes. job. Beat it by a whole five minutes. Yes, and with that, the time is 318, and I am calling this meeting adjourned. You guys have a great rest of your week. Thank you Take all. Care of each Thank, other. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.